live here at the 12 o'clock block here on a given Monday with Marco Mangelsdorf. Marco, uh, me, and Mina maybe sometimes on Monday. Welcome to the show, Marco. Always nice to have you. Well, Monday wouldn't be Monday without starting off with my dear friend Jay Fidel and all our <laughs> our loyal viewers and listeners. So thank you again so much for having me, Jay. Well, we want to we want to follow closely what's going on in energy. We want to get the, uh, you know, the real sea changes, find out what's really going on. Uh, you know, I look for uh, news about, um, you know, energy in Hawaii, and I found, I found a lot of news. Uh, I, I found, um, you know, there was wave energy projects for uh, Kaneohe, um, and uh, there were, there's a Tesla that we know about this one, there's a Tesla um, facility uh, just opened in KIUC in Kauai. Um, there's a uh, energy uh, storage project at UH Hilo. They're putting money into that. Good for them, for their campus. And there's uh, thermal power plants at Pearl Harbor and Hickam and a biofuel plant at, uh, at Schofield. And then there was an article about uh, the fact that 26% of generation uh, among the HECO companies, the one electric companies, um, comes from renewables, although, as you mentioned in our uh, pre-conversation a minute ago, uh, most of the benefit there is on the Big Island, and least of it is in Oahu. And those are, you know, the stories that you expect to see. And, of course, we know one underlying story is uh, the PSIP, which was submitted, what, in December, uh, after a lot of preliminaries, uh, and, the, and, the, and the PUC is supposed to review it. It is the most important thing happening, but it is not happening and I, gosh knows when it will actually be approved or even commented on. Um, so that's, I can't say that's news. It's just something on my radar anyway. But you were quoted again in a newspaper article about solar. And I want to talk about that because I think that solar and the health of the solar industry has got to be the most significant story here because it is the one that counts going forward in real terms, in economic terms. Can you talk about it? Yeah, I'd be happy to, and I couldn't agree more. I think we we live uh, here in Hawaii in a multi-ring circus, Jay, when it comes to energy issues, and it's uh, kind of dizzying sometimes to try to keep up with everything that's going on on so many different fronts uh, seemingly all the time. And, of course, as a small business owner in the solar electric industry, I'm most uh, concerned and interested in what's going on in, in my field, and and industry, and I crunched the numbers for the PV permits issued by the city and county of Honolulu Department of Planning and Permitting for February uh, last month, and they were the fewest PV permits issued, 153 by my count, uh, since I've been crunching this data, going back to 2011. It represents the drop of uh, 66% compared to February of 2016. And I just am reminded painfully of the disconnect between the projections and the rhetoric of uh, dramatically increasing rooftop solar, distributed generation solar, and uh, what I'm seeing, what we're seeing on the ground. And as we've talked about before, it kind of brings to, to, to mind an existential question in terms of how much value should we put on rooftop solar versus typically cheaper utility scale solar should we just double triple quadruple down on utility scale because it's cheaper and that's the way to go or should there be a, a balance or mix between rooftop solar and utility scale solar and if so who will determine that 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 mix uh, and how can the local pv industry uh, be adequately supported during this very difficult and challenging transition time that we're in well, let me let me ask you. I mean, what comes to mind here is um, how how does the demise, or at least the decline, of the solar industry, the rooftop solar industry, if you will, affect the uh, the plans and hopes of the utility of all the utilities um, to build a you know a utility scale solar farms? Um, does it have any effect on them? Does it have some effect? You know, I've all, I've often thought that. Uh, you know, in the, in the crisis among that industry right now, what they could do is, is go to the utility and, um, and make proposals um, to build utility-scale solar. But I don't think that's happened, and I'm not sure it can happen. But 
I think, uh, well, I'd like to hear from you about the relationship of the demise of the industry and the ability of utilities to do utility scale solar. I think they're, they're kind of parallel track and there's not a whole lot of crossover between, between those, those parallel tracks in the sense that you have utility scale solar typically being done by uh, much larger companies, oftentimes based uh, outside of Hawaii, whether it's Solar City or REC Solar, who have been doing utility scale solar in our state, uh, whereas the rooftop solar is uh, much more, I think, focused uh, or being served by, by local companies. And if you look at the power supply improvement plan, which was submitted by the Hawaiian Electric Companies back in uh, December 23rd, they are proposing, at least in the near term, 2017 to 2021, a mix of rooftop solar and utility scale solar to in various uh, various proportions, depending on uh, the f one of the five islands that they're that they're looking at at the time. So I'm not sure if that's really answering your question very well, but they, they ultimately they see a mix between rooftop solar and the larger scale solar. Can they get a bigger piece of the action on utility scale solar? I mean, after all, they've installed an enormous tens of thousands of uh, solar rooftops in Hawaii. They must know a, a thing or two about, uh, you know, putting down panels and connecting them up. Why, why can't they do this work? Why aren't the utilities involved in actually installing rooftop solar on, on customers' homes? No. Why can't the, uh, why, why can't the, uh, the industry, the rooftop installers, the residential installers do, um, you know, the large-scale uh, solar farms? Why can't they do that? Why does it have to be from the mainland? Well, that, that's a good question, and I think... Uh, I don't have a really good answer for you. I think uh, it has to do at least partially with the fact that mainland companies have uh, have much deeper pockets. And in the case of, let's say, Solar City, I mean, uh, let's let's be really clear here. This is a company that uh, had just did a project, completed a project, uh, and deserves a lot of accolades uh, on on Kauai Island uh, using. Uh, Tesla battery storage to the tune of 50 plus megawatt hours of storage, which was definitely groundbreaking. And my hats off to David Bissell and his whole crew over there at Kia. Yeah, mine too. But the reality is undeniable, Jay, which is Solar City, is a company now part of the Tesla group. Uh, it's a company that, since it was uh, opened its doors in, in 2006, so going on 11 years ago, has never made a penny worth of profit. In fact, last year they lost over $800 million. They've never been profitable. So, uh, you know, it's my lament, my frequent lament, that it's really hard for local companies here to compete against the likes of big giants in uh, elsewhere, coming from elsewhere. Well, you know, the, afford but isn't, isn't the natural process of a successful industry, in fact, for that matter, a consolidating industry, to do mergers and acquisitions? and have a lot of these little guys come together in bigger capital concentrations where they can do bigger jobs and have d deeper pockets. Why hasn't that happened? Well, I mean, it, it has. There have been attempts, but uh, I think what I can conclude after you know, being both a participant and a, and a keen observer of this industry over the years is that uh, making a profit uh, is, can be incredibly elusive uh, depending on the market segment, in this particular case, when it comes to the finance end or the project development side, when you look at the likes of Solar City or Sunrun or Sun Edison, which is uh, now dissolved because they uh, they, they couldn't uh, figure out a way to make it work, or Vivint Solar that got effectively chased out of the state, I mean, it's it's rather noteworthy to say the least that uh, to date, at least over the past ten years or so, that very little profit, if any has been made by these companies. So what, what sense does it make if you're losing money to have one losing company merge with another losing company, losing money type of company? So, I mean, this is all kind of over my head to some degree, Jay, but uh, I do know how to read a 10K form. I do know how to read a balance sheet and a profit and loss, and it just continues to astound me that there are as many active players as there are who have been notorious in terms of losing money, losing money, losing money, and they're still they're still somehow uh, you know playing in the in the arena.
Well, let me ask you this. I mean, it just comes to mind. I mean, why are they losing money? This is such a hot industry. It's, I mean, or at least a hot prospect. And it's so important to Hawaii and people will pay, won't they? Um, well, why is it that all these companies are losing money here in, you know, in, in the epicenter of renewable energy? Well, they don't break it down in terms of they're profitable in this market or losing money in that market, or maybe they're losing money in all markets. I don't know. They don't go into that level of detail in, in their financial uh, disclosures. But, I mean, again, really simplistically, you lose money when you are selling whatever product or service that you are offering uh, at a loss. In other words, it's costing you more to do it than the revenue coming in. Now, typically the law of capitalism is that those companies that lose money get winnowed out and they die and they go away, right? And that's the, that's the vast majority of capitalist con companies live and die based on profitability, right? That that's, doesn't take a PhD in political science or economics to make that observation. Sure, sure. But you've got a very small percentage of companies uh, who are still the beneficiary of having new money come in from investors who believe that it still makes sense to invest in the company. So, you know, it's almost kind of quasi-ponzi scheme like you take the new money and you pay off the old money, and as long as the new money is coming in at a fast enough clip, you keep the company business until the new money starts drying up, and then that's when the alarm bells start going off, which is what happened with Sun Edison, obviously. Sure. So. But, you know, you know it, it was, what strikes me, though, is that, um, especially with the, the, the sort of Ponzi approach to things, to try to understand things, is um, that the guys who are succeeding, uh, say, Solar City and... Um, I mean, in that project in Kauai with the te Tesla batteries, it's all very close in. Uh, are they really making money, or are, are they going to have a loss too? Is this is this like the fair wars, where the solar wars, if you will, where everybody's losing money, but they keep on making proposals? Uh, you know, you make it up in volume, you make up your loss, and it's a joke, <laughs> right? It's a joke. Uh, I don't understand why they keep doing it if they're losing money. Uh, it, what's the difference between a company, if there is one here in Hawaii, that makes money installing solar and then ones that loses money and goes out of business. There must be something that one group can learn from the other. There must be some distinguishing business practice uh, that, that some companies use to keep in business and others, well, they don't use that and they go out of, what's happening? I think my dear friend Jay, I probably need to go back to school and, and work on my MBA to give you uh, an answer <laughs> to that because it's, it's all rather befuddling to me at times uh and again i have a, a rather narrow uh, selfish interest and then i'm i have a company that ne necessarily has to be profitable otherwise i go away and we are competing myself and other local companies are competing against uh, other firms who are able to lose tremendous amounts of money and and stick around so it's uh and it makes for a difficult uh, environment well to let me in. ask you this then what why those firms piling the money in why are those firms, you know, willing to take a loss? They must have some long-range plan or expectation that makes them stay in the game and continue to take losses. What is that? Do they think that there's a rainbow, a, a pot of gold at the end of this very difficult rainbow? Well, you would think that new money coming in would have some uh, assurance or high probability of getting repaid, right? Mm -hmm. So what that rainbow or pot of gold at the end is, I'm really not clear i mean if you and then i'm not a historian in terms of the history of amazon and jeff bezos's uh, success and clearly the guy seems to be from all outwards appearances quite successful but uh, i mean amazon was losing money year after year after year after year i got to believe they they're profitable now and he's gone on to bigger better things buying washington post and other other uh, mm -hmm. acquisitions so i'm i'm sure there's uh, you know an, an mba a dissertation or thesis them out that are somewhere to to be able to answer those questions more more directly uh, I, I agree Marco it, and I that's why I'm, I'm offering you this one minute break so you can crack the books <laughs> for a minute and then when we come back we'll, we'll try harder and we'll also try to figure out what we can do as a state and and for that matter as counties um, to try to uh, you try to continue um, you know installing solar we'll be right back Aloha, my name is Justine Esperitu, and I am the co-host of Hawaii Farmers Series. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson, and we are live with you every Thursday at 4 p.m. at thinktechhawaii.com. And our show focuses on Hawaii's local food 
uh, community. We feature not only the farmers that are producing our food, but we also feature the supporters and other folks involved in the community that are trying to promote local agriculture. <laughs> My name is Ray Tsuchiyama, and I'm from Kalihi Palama. Spent 20 years in Tokyo, Japan, came back after the great earthquake. I watch Think Tech all the time and hope everybody follows it on the internet because it is a program that is devoted to the future of Hawaii and brings all concerned citizens together to create a better society for all. Okay, we're back, we're live, we, now we know more. And uh, you, by the way, I, I heard, Marco, that this, you know, that, you know talk about this cyber, cyber terrorism and all that, this show is being tapped. There are people actually listening to this show, Marco. Hope it doesn't trouble you. Well, uh, maybe people like Kim Jong-un in North Korea and all his peeps, you know, if they're listening to you, Jay, that gives me a little bit of hope about the Korean Peninsula perhaps not blowing up in some big fireball. <laughs> okay, Kim Jong-un, you know, if you're listening, don't, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's let's talk about let's talk about what can be done here. Um, you know, we have we have a declining solar industry. We have outside companies pouring uh, money into uh, projects that may not be successful. We do not have. I think you will agree with me. We do not have a sustainable arrangement for installing solar either on rooftops or in larger facilities because nobody's making money. What will happen? And I mean, ultimately, in say five years, and also, what can we do about it? Is that all you want to ask me? That's Jay? all I want. How many hours? You, you do had now? you had a minute to look at it. Now you should be ready. Oh boy. <clears throat> well, I guess maybe we'll fall back on uh, the executive summary from the power supply improvement plan submitted to the commission PUC back in December 23rd of, of last year, and it gives um, a really useful kind of projection uh, roadmap of the Hawaiian Electric Company's plans for their five islands. Oahu, Maui, Molokai, and Lanai, and the Big Island, and uh, they're showing a mix uh, of, uh, you know, from essentially solar, solar and wind, from big solar to little solar, and mostly big wind. And uh, interestingly, I just spoke to one of the reporters from the uh, Hawaii Tribune Herald, which is the East Side paper here on this island, mm -hmm. uh, earlier today, and he's going to be looking at. Uh, uh, how the PSIPs uh, look, uh, how the PSIP for this island looks specifically. And it'll be interesting to see what he comes up with uh, because, I mean, I give full credit to my Hawaiian Electric friends for spending a tremendous amount of time and effort and money and resources to uh, put out this last uh, PSIP, which was, uh, by my count, either the fourth, uh, third or fourth iteration of, the, of uh, PSIPs gone, gone by. And you know, I didn't, until, I with, didn't realize course, until you mentioned it a moment ago that there are sub PSIPs for each island in the Hawaiian Electric um, uh, universe. Uh, am I right about that? There are sub PSIPs, and so each island has a plan. That is correct. So let's talk so, about the Big Island. Well, the Big Island, what stands out to me is that they're projecting uh, 30 plus megawatts just for the next five years, 30 plus megawatts of additional rooftop solar or, or DG solar distributed generation solar. And that's uh, an increase of about a third or so uh, of the existing, from the existing uh, capacity of rooftop solar. So I'd say it's fairly aggressive, it's fairly ambitious. And uh, it flies in the face of what I'm seeing uh, admittedly very early on in 2017, late 2016, early 2017, that the uh, permit numbers for rooftop solar are the lowest I've seen since I've been crunching this data. So th there's a substantial disconnect between the more highfalutin 50,000 foot level projections of 30.3 megawatts of additional DGPV on this island and what we're seeing over the past few months. Now, do I hope that things will change? Obviously, obviously, but it just shows right now at least there's a substantial disconnect. Uh, for utility scale solar, they're projecting uh, one megawatt worth of grid scale PV on this island. And note, for the record, Jay, that there's not a single grid-scale PV project on this island, whereas there are projects on Maui and there are projects on Oahu and there are projects on Kauai. That is not the case for the Big Island. So they're making a very modest uh, one megawatt mm. uh, projection for this island. Why that they did that, 
I, I don't know. And they're also projecting uh, an additional 22 megawatts of grid-scale wind. Now note that right now they're about 20 megawatts uh, at South Point here on this island. They're about 11 megawatts up in Javi. That comes out to 30 plus. And the, the water department has about 5 megawatts, but that's not really included because that's just used for water pumping as far as I understand. Mm -hmm. So how likely is another 22 megawatts of grid-scale wind on this island? Uh, where are these 400 foot or so turbines going to go? What kind of pushback is there going to be from the community? Uh, wherever they are proposed to go, so it's it, it's not a it's not uh, a namby pamby type of projection that Hawaiian Electric has has put down here when they're looking at another 22 or 20 plus megawatts worth of wind, and there hasn't been new wind here that's been feeding into the grid uh, for years and years and years. So are, are people but, uh, are people in the Big Island, um, you know, down on wind? I mean, like for example, the people on Lanai, they're down on wind. Um, what about the Big Island? Is there, you know, an inherent resistance to wind? There hasn't really been much of a discussion yet, but I have no reason to believe that big wind turbines would be seen with a tremendous amount of favorability or or a whole lot of aloha. I think typically, it's it's hard to get all warm and fuzzy feelings about 200 foot, 400 foot wind turbines anywhere in your view plane or. Uh, or somehow you're going to be affected by that very low frequency vibration that can sometimes propagate over a great distances. Now, I mean, I mean, I, I know my friends at Peniolo Power have certainly been looking into wind for their some of their land of Parker Ranch, of which there were major land holding here. But I think in general, you know, big wind is kind of a hard slog. It doesn't matter what island you propose it on, you're going to get uh, some some of the usual suspects, as I'll call them, who will push back on it. But the thing is, thing is I'm, I'm fully cognizant that any, any proposal or any plan is going to find resistance. So uh, I don't want to just carp from the sidelines in terms of what Hine Electric is proposing to do, because regardless of the mix that they would propose, they would be criticized, they'll be challenged. But, you know, the well, thing you is, know, we can't just... So these things, now, they're in the plan. The plan is in front of the PUC. You've pointed out, just, just for discussion purposes, two things... Uh, that, you know, that um, are practical problems, you know. One is that the, um, you know, the, the, it's hard to find um, um, people who um, are uh, willing to do storage. And it's hard to find people who are willing to do uh, wind. And, and it's not just the, that the local residents like it or don't like it. Somebody's got to be willing to put the money in. And presumably, in the, in the case of utility scale, well, they're both utility scale, really, both the storage and the wind, um, I guess the utility would go out and do an RFP and, and hope that, um, you know, it will be met, that there will be proposals, and the proposals will be funded, you know, by, by the developers. But if the developers don't have the money or, or are not interested in investing money in those things, in a, you know, in a practical way, maybe um, worrying of, of the same issues you're worrying about, it won't happen. You can make all the RFPs you want. It won't happen. And then the right. question to me, and this is the question I put to you, is so we have these practical problems and maybe investor interest problems. Are these the kinds of things that the PUC is going to consider in approving or tweaking you know, the, the PSIP plan? I would think they would have to, Jay. I mean, uh, the pieces are, are complicated, are very complicated, and I know that they are engaging with outside uh, consultants and paying them, I'm sure, a reasonable, if not pretty penny, uh, in order to come up with something more definitive or as a final determination on this long process of the PSIP. So when the commission is going to issue a de de decision and order or, de or decide to tell Hawaiian Electric, well, you know, you made some progress here and there, but you need to do it again. I kind of lean against that last scenario. I think uh, they probably will uh, uh, come up with some type of a DNO that is going to uh, accept some of what Hawaiian Electric has proposed and reject other parts, depending on what they get from outside consultants. So it's really kind of a big crapshoot right now, and uh, it's part of the, the three or four what I call power dockets that are before the commission yeah. right now that will be uh, hopefully decided in fairly short order at yeah. least over the next 6 to 12, 18 months. Yeah, and rejecting the whole thing out of, out of hand and saying, well, it'll come back again. We've seen that before, um, and it's, it's not a pretty picture. And, in fact, we've been um, you're trying to get a plan together for how many years now, uh, and it hasn't happened. This is, this is, the, you know, this is the, um, the upshot of, what, five years of trying to get a plan together. Wow. 
I hope they yeah. don't. I hope they don't just yeah. reject it out of hand. That would that would leave us essentially in the lurch, all of us. No, I mean I, I agree. I think uh, they're more likely to uh, to not uh, tell them to go back to the drawing board yet a what a fourth or fifth time, but uh, come up with some type of uh, DNO based on the inputs of the interveners of Hawaiian Electric, the consumer advocate, and their outside consultants to to shape something that's going to uh, to provide the, 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 the road map to going where we want to go, which is to uh, ideally lower electric costs and, and also bring on more cost-effective renewables and keep the lights on. I mean, those are the big three. Yeah, right? but let those me ask you this, though. Suppose for various um, environmental reasons and energy, you know, connectivity reasons, they decide they're going to go along with it, <clears throat> and they're going to they're want uh, the big storage and they're going to want big wind. Um, or some, you know, some approximation of what has been proposed. Um, n now, there are practical problems, but, but certainly we have a legislature out there, and um, we have an energy office out there, we have a governor out there who could, who could tweak the market. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do when you want to change human conduct. Um, you have government come in and do incentive things or disincentive things, and you make it work. That's how Robert Moses, uh, you know, built uh, most of the a transportation system in New York. He made it happen. He made a plan, then he made it happen. So uh, is, it, is it in the wood, in the works here uh, that they would come up with a plan and the plan would say, well, yeah, we'd like to see this happen. We're approving this or whatever, or modifying it, whatever, but we want the legislature to step in. We're operating on the assumption the legislature will step in. We're operating on the assumption that the energy office will do stuff. We're operating on the assumption that the governor will do stuff. Uh, we want you all to come along and, uh, and be part of this process. It's not just between us and unnamed developers. It's between us and everybody, including other, other arms of government. Isn't that the way it can work? Well, when you've got more cooks in the kitchen, I mean, it's going to take a longer time to get the, uh, the, the courses to the tables, right? And I think, uh, I mean, you, you can see the example right now of a bill that I'm not sure if it made the crossover last week or not. I, I'd have to look into that. But uh, the bill, which we discussed a couple weeks ago, to uh, make the commission go from three commissioners to five and also uh, essentially very much uh, insert legislature, legislative priorities into uh, a reformulation of the Public Utilities Commission. So, I mean, while kind of on the surface, I like the idea of having five commissioners in Greater Neighbor Island representation from what I know about other parts of that bill, assuming it's still alive, it, it had some, some areas that uh, were less, uh, less palatable. So, I mean, we already have an energy environment where we have so many different players uh, that, uh, you know, sitting down and passing the kava bowl around is all well and good uh, and uh, trying to get to consensus. But, I mean, you and I both know that there are so many, so many, so many examples of uh, so many players uh, being at the table, passing the bowl around, that uh, it can often lead to paralysis, or at least years and years and years go by before yeah. act action is effectively taken. I mean, and is that really the best way to run a railroad? No, no, and we have to avoid distraction. Paralysis, distraction, it's all the same thing. We can't be distracted. We have to see the vision, and we have to go for the vision, and we, and we, don't, we can't let anything get in the way. Except we're going to have to let two weeks get in the way, Marco. We're going to have to take two weeks off and come back two weeks from now and continue this very important discussion. It's, gr it's great. Uh, it's been great. It's always great to talk with you, Marco. I look forward to our next time together. Uh, as do I, and uh, you are the master of the segue, Jay. I'm going to nominate you for an award if, uh, if you're ever given the opportunity. <laughs> the segue award. Thank you, Marco Manglestorf, ProVision Solar and Hilo. Aloha, and Thank we'll you, see Jay. you next time. You rock. <laughs> Bye.